Hi, this is Mark McPherson, movie critic for Moviespoon.com and TwinCitiesGeek.com. Well, it's been quite a while since I've reviewed some movies here on Movies with Mark. I've been pretty busy lately. In fact, I'm so busy uh, that I'm not going to be able to film in my basement this time. I'm actually going to be filming in my car. I'm actually filming in between uh, screenings right now. I'm just about to go into the screening of American Assassin. But before I go in for that, uh, let's talk about It and Rebel in the Rye. Our first movie is It, uh, based on the Stephen King novel. Most people remember the miniseries with... Tim Curry playing Pennywise the Clown, and for a lot of people that's how they mostly remember it. Uh, here we have Bill Skarsgård playing the clown Pennywise, who lures children down into the sewers and then eats them or kills them, or but essentially just plays on their fears and he lures them down there. Now, I was expecting this film to just be, you know, a typical ride, and for the most part, yeah, it is kind of a, a horror ride, but it, it goes for it. It goes for a lot of crazy crazy ideas and, and weird weird visuals and different means of Pennywise attacking and eating the kids and biting their arms off and coming out of like still frames and stuff like that. Oh, it's so much crazy crap. Uh, but but the, the really surprising thing here is that uh, you actually get to know and like the kids that Pennywise is stalking here. And that's a good thing because like in the miniseries, and I assume in the book, I haven't actually read the book, uh, we spend a lot of time with the kids, and if you're going to spend that much time with the kids, you better like them, and you do like them. There, there's so much to like about these kids. Uh, they're a lot of fun. They, they get in the F word a bunch of times. You know, it takes place in the '80s, and they, it feels a lot like Stranger Things. And of course, they use the kid from Stranger Things, so obviously, we're going to get that comparison. And you know, yeah, there's a big resurgence right now of kind of like having the '80s in, in horror films. Like there was a film I think called like Beyond the Gate. But yeah, like the '80s are like a big thing now to like put in horror films, and they, they do it pretty well here. I mean. They mostly just keep the references in the background. I mean, yeah, you know, they, they mention, like, Michael Jackson in passing, and you, you see the theater in the background. It's playing, uh, you know, Lethal Weapon 2 and Batman and Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5. So they don't go too overboard with the references. They mostly keep them in the background, kind of like Pennywise. Um, they mostly keep Pennywise in the background here, mostly because we get to play on the fears of the kids. You know, Pennywise doesn't seem as frightening, especially since he's a lot of, like, CGI with the creature effects here. Um but it plays more on the fears of the kids and they have and you like the kids so much and like their fears feel relatable and they feel like real kids like and they talk like real kids too that's i think the big thing like these child actors are amazing and you know a lot of times you know people are like you know uh oh, child actors they can't really act that well no these kids are amazing i cannot wait to see what these kids do next um not sure if they'll show up in the sequel because obviously you know the the second chapter here is going to take place with the adults but the adults have a lot to live up to um Pennywise's scares, uh, I thought they were actually pretty cool. There's there's some neat effects here. They're uh, they're not as scary, you know, for playing on the, the fears of kids. But I think you know, in terms of like relating it to you know what kids would be afraid of, I think it's actually pretty effective at being scary. You know, for, for the most part, you know, everyone's going to be laughing like like oh my goodness, like this crazy stuff. Pennywise contorting his body, and he's uh, thankfully they don't do the whole like ridiculous spider type deal. Uh, but they do have some of these bizarre visuals where Pennywise is unhinging his jaw and he's, he's dancing around and all this crazy crap. Um, and I actually kind of dug it as both, uh, as an equal mix of both like a ride and a psychological horror. Like, um, like if you want to think of it this way, think of like, um, it comes at night as sort of like the most psychological of horror. And then think of like, you know, something like, like Annabelle creation or the conjuring is kind of like a ride, a ride of horror. It is kind of in the middle here. You know, it's got a little bit of the psychological elements. It's got a little bit of the ride. Um, and I absolutely, I had a ball watching this. And, uh, and a lot of people did too, apparently, because it's breaking all kinds of records, which is amazing because that tells studios that, look, horror movies are hot right now. So make more of them and make them good. Make them about characters and make them, uh, make the scares like effective. Go for it. Spend the money. Spend the money. Make it, <laughs> make them damn good. Because a lot of horror films have been skating by with uh, very cheap cheap budgets here and this one is a pretty high budget up there in like 30 million so uh i absolutely love this film um i i hope it does well i hope the sequel does well as well uh i said a lot of wells there especially since there's a well in the movie uh but yeah for it i'm gonna give it three and a half stars and quickly here we're gonna do a review of rebel in the rye which is a uh, biographical film based on jd stallinger and his writings of catcher in the rye now um I was I was kind of looking forward to this film to like learn a little bit more about J.D. Salinger and he's played he's played pretty well here by Nicholas Holt. I think he does a sufficient job. Uh, his writing teacher is played by Kevin Spacey and Kevin Spacey always does a great job. He's amazing in everything he's in. Um, but I was kind of looking to to learn more about J.D. Salinger and it felt like this this story focuses mostly on 
him writing Catcher in the Rye and nothing else. Like, it doesn't really focus on, you know, other aspects of his life, like, you know, like his, his marriage, his children, uh, how he feels dis distant in society, how he didn't do too well at school, how, how he went off to war. But no, they, they skip past most of this so that we can get to, you know, him getting back to writing Catcher in the Rye, which, you know, I, you know, most people, I think a few people tell you, like, oh, Catcher in the Rye, you know, I didn't really care much for that book. It just seemed kind of kind of whiny and angsty, and when you watch uh, J.D. Salinger in this, you're kind of like, yeah, you know, th this, this guy's kind of a jerk, and there's there's really not much to his life here, especially the way that the movie kind of, like, peters out. Like, it just feels like it's covering the key events of J.D. Salinger's life, and then we get up to that point where he, you know, pretty much goes into exile and cuts himself off from everyone, and just, the, the movie just kind of peters out from there. I mean, I like to admire the film for that, for, uh, uh, for not you know, focusing so much on, like, the easy points of drama, but at the same time, it doesn't really focus on any points of drama here. It just kind of, it just kind of lingers and doesn't really say much about J.D. Salinger, and, uh, it's, it's more like a Catcher in the Rye, like the making of the Catcher in the Rye book, and, and nothing really else, cause, nothing else, because you don't really learn that much about J.D. Salinger that would make you understand it better as a character, <laughs> the fact that he was mostly just a jerk. Uh, so for Rebel in the Rye... Um, you know, I, I really like Holt and, uh, and Spacey in the role, so, you know, for that, I'll go a little bit easy on it. Uh, two stars for Rebel on the Rye. Well, it's just about showtime here, so I'm gonna go into the theater here and see, um, American Assassin, and I'll be right back, uh, to let you know what I thought. Well, that sucked. Yep. So, The American Assassin. Uh, this film makes one fatal flaw right from the very beginning that ruined the entire film for me, which is it relies on uh, the, the current political climate of Iran with uh, with Muslim terrorists. Uh, it showcases like real footage, and and from that very moment, I, I started getting really soured on the film. Okay, so here's how the film begins. It begins kind of like a typical thriller of a guy seeking revenge. Uh, Dylan O'Brien plays this young guy who's at the beach. He's just proposed to his girl, and he's filmed it, and everyone claps for him, and he goes off to get his girl drinks from the bar, and hopes that oh, hopefully nothing bad will happen to her when I go get her drinks. Well, it turns out the worst thing happens to her. A bunch of Muslim terrorists come to the beach and start shooting up everyone in sight, and there's and, and when I say shoot up, I don't mean like, you know, they bring out guns and like fire and a couple of people fall down. No, I mean there's like squibs going off and blood going all over the place, people getting shot in the legs and the face, and of course her girlfriend gets it right in the chest. And then again in the head. And then he gets it in the, the side of the stomach and the, the leg and there's blood everywhere and it's very gruesome. And now we, s we skip ahead 18 months later and he's on the hunt for revenge. He's gonna infiltrate the Muslim terrorist group and take them all down somehow. But apparently the CIA has been tracking him because they think like, oh, this kid's pretty stupid for wanting to take down a bunch of Muslim terrorists, but maybe we can use him. Maybe he's a really great warrior that we can train. And so Dylan O'Brien ends up being trained by the CIA by Michael Keaton, who's been a, a veteran CIA operative, and he teaches them everything he knows in the field. And the first thing he teaches them is, you know, like, try to kill me with a knife. And, like, they fight out in the field, and then there's a whole ridiculous virtual reality simulation. Uh, now, they're sent into Iran to stop this uh, this stolen nuke deal. It's a fairly standard, you know, like, a, there's a terrorist out there uh, and we have to stop him and it turns out he has like personal uh, he has a personal agenda for wanting to set up this nuke and and blow it off somewhere within Rome around there something like that uh, and of course like Michael Keaton says like one of the rules of working as a CIA operative is you know d don't let it get personal don't get it personally involved it's gonna screw everything up and of course things do get personal for both Keaton and O'Brien here they both make the big mistakes of letting their uh, personal feelings get in the way, and it, the film, it just creates this very sour cynicism to everything, where if you feel like everyone is out to kill each other, and nobody trusts anyone, like at one point, you know, uh, uh, O'Brien is working with a, uh, with an Iranian woman who's a CIA operative, but then he thinks like, maybe she's working for the enemy, oh, she is working for the enemy, and starts like strangling her and everything, um, and O'Brien, he keeps on having these visions of like the of the terrorist he wanted to kill, who he set his sights on to kill before, and he starts seeing him everywhere, uh, and he starts tracking down the Muslim terrorists and, like, shooting them, and, and he's... And O'Brien, you gotta mention this, he's such an unlikable guy. Like, from the moment after his girlfriend dies, he starts training at a gym, but he's, he's, he's way too violent, so they kick him out. Uh, the people at his apartment hate him because he's, he's, 
he stays up all hours of night and he's just like throwing knives at the wall um, and just he's such an unlikable guy and he doesn't really do anything to, to get over his girlfriend's death it's just no he needs to get revenge he needs to kill he needs to kill he needs to kill which is like such unlikable characters as like Michael Keaton he's not really given much to do here with this character most of the time uh, he's just kind of, you know, just giving his usual, like, Keaton grinning and, and kind of quick talking and trying to sound like a hard ass, which he does well enough, but, you know, for, for this material, they, they really makes him out to be a psychopath. Like, these, these guys are trained to be essentially just nothing but killers. I mean, these are guys supposed to be working with the CIA, but all they really train for is combat, just combat, combat, combat. And they're supposed to be doing these kind of like covert missions where they're undercover and everything. And it, I get the feeling like it's one of those thrillers where it was entirely written just so they could show off, you know, well, like, well, here's how like a CIA operative would hold a gun and here's how this operation would go down and here's here's how it leads up. It's kind of kind of like, you know, a little bit like, like a Tom Clancy type book. I don't know. I've, I've never read the book, so I'm not quite sure. Uh, what this novel is like, but the way that this film plays out, it seems like it was more interested in military tactics uh, than it was with its characters, which, again, I would have been fine with if they made it very heavily laser focused on the military angle here because then they bring in the, these like the, the the politics of everything and and the, the personal vendettas and it's all this like cliche stuff like like oh and there's oh my god there's like a there's a horrible torture scene where Michael Keaton is electrocuted and sliced up and he's burnt and his and his fingernails are pulled off really slowly and it's trying to be as grotesque as possible and violent and it's like this is a very ridiculous thriller about, you know, stealing a nuke, and and it's trying to be, like, ultra-violent, it's trying to be, like, very, like, political about everything, it's trying to showcase Muslim terrorists and everything, it's just, and it just, it, it left such an ugly impression on me. I just, I, it was tough to get through this film, especially because it has its moments of, like, ridiculous comedy. Some of it's unintentional. Like, at one point, O'Brien is stalking uh, uh, one of, the, like, the suspects, and he follows him to a hotel, but, oh, no, he has guard dogs, so he's got to stop the guard dogs, and he's, and he's running over the, the tops of cars, like, trying to escape these guard dogs that are chasing him across the cars. It's like, what film is this? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, it would almost be likable just for how ridiculous it is, especially when we get to the ending where uh, where the nu a nuke actually does go off and it and it turns into a disaster movie at that point, which is kind of ridic ridiculous. I'm like, what is going on here? It's like, ah, oh. if you know, and if it didn't rely so much on like like current events and like like I said, they showcase real. There's a really bizarre moment where they show like a, a Muslim terrorist recruitment video and it's kind of and it's kind of like shot, you know, with like uh with you know all the violence and uh showing them what they're fighting for, all the 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 dead children that they wanted to protect, but it's set against like loud rock music. And there's it looks like they're showing actual I'm not quite sure if it is but the way it looks all grainy, it looks like they're showing actual footage of uh, of people who were people who are killed and like kids that are dead. It's like, "Oh god, no, it's like, you know, it, it feels like this thriller, like, it feels like with trying to amount all this violence and all this politics going on, like, they meet with, like, Iranian officials and everything, and, of course, they're working under the table and something evil is happening, and there's all this stuff that's being built up, and none of it works just because, like, I hated the characters in this, and just their cynicism and the sourness of it all, and being overly violent, and overly dark, and not really finding a tone, and trying to be silly and cliche, and all these different tones. Like, oh, it's just, it was a draining film, man. It was just an ugly, draining film. So yeah, I guess you could say I kind of really didn't like the American Assassin. So. For the American Assassin, I'm gonna have to go with one and a half stars, and I'm only going easy on it just because, uh, just because Keaton and O'Brien I think are good in this, even though the script is requiring them to do some really silly stuff, especially the last shot. Seriously, when you see how absurd the last shot in this is, it, it just it it threw me. It <laughs> I I'm beyond words at this point. Remember, you can read more of my reviews at moviespoon.com or twincitiesgeek.com. My name is Mark McPherson, and thank you for watching.